Hey guys, I am back this week with my good friend John Sharkey. John is a clinical anatomist who is world renowned and famous, and today we are talking fascia. In fact, he is taking a break from the Fashion Net Plastination Project in Guben, Germany. He's been working on some really cool stuff with fascia, and he was kind enough to take a break and talk fascia with me. Some of this is visual, but you don't need to see it to understand it. John's a great teacher, and he can explain fascia like no one else. Fascinating conversation with a brilliant friend. Thanks for listening, everyone. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Why are you Why are you in Germany? What have you been up to? Okay, so um, let, let me sh let me play um, a little video for you. So can I share the screen, Tim? Um, have I got yeah. permissions to do that? So I just uh, I said I'd share this with the uh, community, original strength community. Here we go. So this will kind of put things in perspective for you. So this is the kind of uh, plastination that Dr. Gunther von Hagens produces. If anybody has not seen them before, um, well, here's a little introduction to one, what I'm doing and where I am and what plastination is. Hello, Tim. Hello, Sarah, and everybody from Original Strength. John Sharkey, clinical anatomist here, and I'm at the von Hagen's Plastinarium here in Guben, Germany. You can see the type of plastination models that uh, Dr. Gunther von Hagen is uh, famous for. He actually invented the plastination process. And I'm here in Guben as part of what's known as the Fascia Net Plastination Project. Let me actually just pan the phone around here so you can get to see some of the beautiful plastinations. This is quite a large exhibit here in Guben. Uh, and you can see various different types of plastinations. That one, of course, being the vasculature of the human body. And also there would be exploded uh, plastinations where like this one up here, for instance, and one further up, where we get to see a lot of the detail of the neurovascular structures of the muscles, the tendons. However, what is often missing, in fact, what's missing for the most part in uh, these particular uh, specimens is the fascia. And I think you know that that's a speciality of mine. And uh, part of what I try to do is to go around the world and encourage people to pay more attention to the fascia. So for example, if you're somebody who's involved in exercise science, then muscle fiber recovers at a very different rate to the fascial tissue. And uh, one needs to understand that science. One needs to understand uh, how long it takes for fascial tissue to recover, dependent on the type of exercise the person is involved in. Uh, otherwise, what's going to happen, of course, is you're going to enter into that area of overtraining or what they call staleness or under recovery. So it's really uh, very humbling to be here uh, as a lead anatomist with my colleagues, Dr. Robert Schleip and Dr. Carla Stecco, actually joining us uh, this week as well. I've literally just come out of the dissection room um, is uh, Dr. Uh, Jab van de Waal, uh, as well as some other um, visiting dignitaries. Uh, we're very, very uh, lucky to have um, many of these people. And of course, from the Plastinarium, um, we have Dr. Vladimir Chermensky, who has joined us. And the staff here at the Plastinarium are just absolutely amazing. So if you ever get the opportunity to be able to visit uh, the Body Worlds exhibition, I'd highly recommend it. And I particularly recommend the one in Berlin, because in Berlin, that is where you'll get to see the first uh, full body specimen of both superficial and deep fascia. So um, I just thought I'd do this little small intro video for you to give you a sense of, uh, of what I'm doing and what I'm doing here because it's really his history in the making. So now we might just have a little chat. There we go. So just before we do have a little chat, Tim, on the left hand side there, these are some of the earlier plastinates. Now plastinate means that we take tissues we dissect them from the body, and then they go through a series of steps, gas curing, they go into a, a vat um, of acetone, where the acetone removes all of the fluids from the tissues, and replaces it with a liquid silicone. And then we position the, the, the specimens. These are cross sections, small specimens, uh, but they are then plastinated and they're going to last a lot longer than myself or yourself. They'll last up to 10,000 years. So the one on the left hand side here, where you can see my cursor, these are the, the muscle fibers. Uh, we have the fascia removed here, so you can see the muscle. But of course this would be 
this would be you know, covered and embraced with fascia. In fact, the muscle fibers invest into the fascia. They are continuous with the fascia. They're not separate to the fascia. Um, but it's just to, uh, to give a sense of the continuity. So you see uh, gluteus maximus here and you see it um, continuing on down uh, up here would be tensor fascia lata, TFL, and you can see then other muscles would be investing into this tissue as well, but this is then, you know, coming into your iliotibial band. So that connective tissue that goes all the way around your thigh, but is thickened from, you know, pr pretty much the top of your, your femur, the greater trochanter, um, all the way down to the distal end of the femur, to the, to the tibial plateau. So it's thick along that particular area. But if you're, a, if you're somebody who's a horse rider, you probably find that you have an iliotibial band on the inside of your legs because of placing your feet into the stirrups. And then again, just the uh, specimen on the right hand side. Um, but once again, you just this is a this is a, a muscle tissue having been removed from these compartments, and therefore we're, we're just showing these these uh, compartments with the septa with these um, structures, fascial structures in between. Now this is as false an anatomy as our typical regular classical anatomy, but at least it, it, I call this inside out anatomy. And so at least it, it's flipping anatomy on its head. And now what we're doing this particular week is we're also doing some new dissections and we're including muscle fibers coming into the fascia and so on. So that I think gives you um, some indication. And now that's, I'll come back out of the uh, stop the share and we can have a chat on. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I'm delighted to share that to share that with you because, as I say, it's really history in the making, and um, it's you know a big part of my life uh, trying to encourage people to get their head around around fascia because as a, a clinical anatomist, I was encouraged to cut the fascia, scrape the fascia away, and place it in the, the trays beneath the the donor, beneath the cadaver, and um, it was really considered a kind of a fatty packing it wasn't of any particular importance but uh, but now we know it's very important speaking of that I, I i think i read a paper that you were involved with and, and it was talking about fascial tuning forks yeah yeah fascial tuning pegs yeah tuning pegs yeah what what is a fascial tuning peg well the truth is that almost any tissue in the body could be could be considered a fascial tuning peg um, however, there, what I teach is that there is hierarchy in the human body, which means that not all tissues are the same. So it seems like an easy concept to say that everything is connected to everything else. That, that seems reasonably easy to, to kind of conceive in your head. You grew yourself. So, you know, you, you, as I said before to you, you don't have to attach something onto the body. You grew yourself from your eyeballs to your liver, to your spleen, your lower limbs. So everything is connected to everything else. But what happens in the human body is the human body as it's growing um, rotates and twists and turns. So for example, the muscles that you have on the front of your body or your um, abdomen muscles, your abdominal muscles, they're actually posterior muscles. They originated in the back of your body and ended up on the front of your body. So they started out embryologically as posterior structures and they end up as anterior structures. Um, so things move about and things move about in such a way that they rotate. And when they rotate, I'll use this now, I'm finished for the day, but when they rotate, so something like this, when it rotates and twists, what it does, of course, is it creates, you know, a thickening, which now becomes really strong. And you'd call that a ligament. But you see, before it thickened, you know, if you did that, it, it lengthens and stretches and loses all, you know, of its integrity and that wouldn't be good. So. The original tissue might start out being looking a little flimsy and weak, but as I say, it rotates and it twists and it turns and it does that and all of a sudden it's really, really strong and robust. So the hierarchical thing as well is that if you if, if somebody gave you a, an unexpected perturbation, a, a fright, you would do this. And that shows you that there are certain muscles that are prone to becoming what we would classically call shorten. Um, and those muscles tend to be flexors. So as we get old, we tend to go this way as well. We don't tend to go this way. So that shows you one example of hierarchy um, in the human body. So from that viewpoint, 
um, that fascia tuning pegs, looking at hierarchy as an example, and looking at structures, um, of which really there's very little written about. The paper you're talking about, uh, Tim, I talk about Lysertus fibrosis, which is a, a piece of connective tissue here that looks really flimsy. And um, we can see the, the tendon of the biceps, and we can say, well, the tendon of the biceps is strong and it's condensed, and we can see how that would be responsible for transferring forces from here to do this. You know, you can see that and it makes it, what's this flimsy little piece of tissue here doing? This Lysertus fibrosis, what's that about? And um, my hypothesis on this, and there are several of them, Anconius at the back of the elbow, Poplitius at the back of your knee, there's several of them around the body. And depending on what we're talking about, there are different types of hierarchies. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, in other words, we're not going to be able to get to explain it just in a, in a short uh, conversation, but hopefully I'll give you some sense of it. So the idea here would be that when the certus fibrosis is doing its job properly, it's taking a certain amount of the forces that are being produced different to the tendon. And it's giving feedback because it's rich in what we would refer to as proprioceptors. It's rich in proprioceptors. So its job, like the retinacula in the lower limb, um, their job is to be able to give feedback to the body so that the one the body knows where it is in time and space and it helps to orchestrate um it helps to orchestrate the uh, motion and movement and in fact i go further as well to say i have a little muscle here called palmaris longus and palmaris longus for example has a long tendon coming here into the wrist and if we stop and think well what the heck is palmaris longus doing it seems like a fairly flimsy muscle compared to some of the other forearm flexors and extensors but it comes to this part of your hand here, the hypothenar and thenar eminence. And of course you have, the, you have the, the, the medium nerve running through here. So you've got um, vascular structures and neural structures running through here. And when this muscle is doing its job properly, it creates expansion. It lifts the tissue so that this doesn't get uh, compressed. So if this muscle is hypertonic, if it's spastic, um, or if it's perhaps maybe inhibited, then it, it cannot, do its job. And then what you end up is you end up with wrist problems and wrist pain. So as I say, there's several, there's several fascia tuning pegs around the body temp, but um, they're examples, they're, they're good examples of another one I mentioned in the paper is rectus capitis posterior minor. It's a tuning peg and it has fascial connections right through to the to the dura matter of the brain and the spinal cord. So it's you know hugely important, less important in terms of, of producing motion and more important in terms of giving feedback so that the body knows where it is in time and space. So people with forward head posture, they're people who tend to bang their elbows off things and you know, stump their feet off things and your friends call them clumsy uh, because they're getting, they're, they're getting you know, inappropriate feedback and their, their timing is usually a little bit off. So if a tuning peg is healthy, then it's providing the brain with rich information but if, Absolutely. Uh, if and not just the brain, there's... by the way. So the brain is spinal cord, uh, nerves, peripheral nerves to spinal cord. That's mm -hmm. one, that's one system because there are certain, um, there are certain communiques that happen so fast that the brain only becomes aware of them after they've happened. And then there would be um, communication to the spinal cord up to the cerebral cortex. Uh, decisions have to be made higher order executive decisions, and then a response is given. So that usually takes a little bit more time, uh, such as Golgi tendon organs, if you've heard of them. Every time you did an arm curl, you wouldn't want your, your muscles to become inhibited and for you to let go of the weight. Uh, so Golgi tendon organs are very sensitive to the amount of tension in the system. But once that tension is rising and falling, they're less concerned. But if that tension is rising and rising and rising and reaches a threshold, such as if you were out water skiing and you got suddenly pulled forward, you'd immediately let go. You'd become inhibited immediately. Now, generally speaking, Golgi tendon organs don't generally work that fast. That's, an, that's a really exceptional occasion. But uh, Golgi tendon organs usually take between six and 12 seconds because the body is checking the level of tension and it doesn't want that tension to reach a point where you would burst or herniate the tissue. So it's the opposite to what we call muscle spindles, which are sensitive to tissues lengthening. And if you, if you try to lengthen tissue, the body always tries to shorten. That's the way the body is predicated. It's how you digest food. It's how you urinate and defecate. And everything you do is predicated on your body resisting lengthening. 
And if, you, if we didn't have that, we would not be able to walk. So the first thing we do when we go to move is that we, I'm using classic uh, anatomy language here, physiology language, we eccentrically load tissues. And that eccentric loading is a lengthening. And that's how we react to the lengthening. So we don't start motions with concentric motions. We start them with eccentric motions. It's a, a slight lengthening first. That kicks in the myotactic reflexes and we try to decelerate. In fact, that's a really good way of thinking about muscle. Uh, try to you know, forget about concentric and, and eccentric. Think about acceleration versus deceleration. So this type of action, which you'd call an arm curl, that would be acceleration. And on the way down, which you might call positive and negative phase. So this phase is a deceleration. And that's what the body's about. It's about accelerating and decelerating a moment. I've never heard it explained like that. That is, that was really good. <laughs> um, you should write, you should write strength <laughs> training books. <laughs> so if, if you have, if you have a tuning peg and it's not providing all that information or say it's uh, out of tune, right? How, how do you, how do you retune it or how do you get it back in tune? Okay. So that's a really great question. And that's where really, you know, I get a lot of the movement teachers asking me this question, you know, John, how do we, how do we do it? Because the truth of the matter is that a lot of people try to see if they can make changes through movement, through motion. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's great that people move rather than not move, but the, I, I can't really see anything within movement that's going to correct something, particularly some kind of, you know, um, neurological imbalance. How do you correct that? You have to know how to be able to intervene in terms of being able to um, offer correction. The other thing, of course, is that you have to have the knowledge to know, you know, where is the insult? Which, which tuning peg am I, you know, aiming for? Because although everything is connected, as I said, there's hierarchy. So we may need to look at it from a neural viewpoint. It could be a muscle fiber viewpoint. It might be a fascial uh, issue. It could be lymphatic. You have to be able to know where the problem is. And then the body, in, in my estimation, the body for the most part does have the ability to heal itself. There are times when we need to have medical intervention and there's times when we need to have some other type of manual or movement intervention, but, um, but just moving isn't necessarily going to fix the problem. And certainly, I mean, as an example, I love Pilates. I think Pilates is fantastic, but I also think that far too much of Pilates is carried out on your back. And that can, be, that can be quite useful depending on the scenario, but we don't move on our back. Uh, they're, they're, the natural uh, point of access in the human body uh, are your feet. So your feet are the natural point of access or fulcrum. And then, of course, anything else outside of that is more to do with maybe transitions, um, you know, getting out of bed or uh, something like that, getting up from a chair or whatever the case may be. So we talk a lot about functionality. But if you look at a lot of the exercises that people do, there's no functional relationship to a lot of them. So you wonder, well, and, it's no, and sometimes there's no harm to do some of those exercises. They can be quite nice. Some people like to hang their arm out the, the window of the four by four in the summertime and you know, people seem to like that. And if that's what you're into, well, good luck. Um, I would be recommending, you know, that the, the vast majority of your movement experiences should be full body movement experiences and as much as possible should be from a standing position. Then of course you can get into sports specific or whatever the case may be because sport and just the regular, you know, Uncle Rick or, you know, Auntie, Auntie Teresa or whoever, they're completely different. Sport is not healthy. It might be healthy from a, a mental viewpoint, being, being a member of a team, or so there might be there's different types of health, mental health. But in terms of you know, health, you know, doing ultra marathons um, or you know, exercising seven times, seven days per week, and, or you know, playing top league NFL you know, football, that's, that's not necessarily healthy. And you see these guys that, and girls, they're wrapped up, they're wrapped up in bandages, and, you know, they're getting cortical injections to keep them going and you know so i don't did i did i go off on a bit of a tangent there or did i actually answer the question i want to make sure i answer questions uh kind of yes but it was a great tangent um and and the question was was like how, how do you, you retune, how do you retune? To the pegs? 
Yeah, well, I, again, I, I just wouldn't be able to do justice to a question like that in a, you know, in a, in a conversation like this. But really, it's about, as I say, recognizing what the issue is and then offering an intervention that can restore the synergy. So whether that's at the neuromuscular level or whatever, some people might say, oh, let's just learn to move correctly. But if you've got tissue that's, all, that's spastic, then, you know, how do you move correctly? You're going to be moving with spastic tissue. You know, so and then other times people might say things like, oh, when I move, it feels much better. And when I don't move, it doesn't feel good. Well, you see, that's OK. That's great. And keep moving. But what you might be finding is that motion and movement is acting as a as a hydraulic effect. So it's moving fluids through the tissues and that's clearing away uh, probably noxious metabolites, phosphate, P, bradykinins, you know, neuropeptides. And then the tissues feel good. The problem then is that you, you, you might overexert yourself and do something that really you shouldn't be doing. And now it compounds the problem. So it's not fixing the problem necessarily, but it's compounding it. But having said that, if I had a choice, I'd be telling you to move rather than not move. So you brought up uh, the thing about sports not being healthy and then talking about Aunt Teresa and Uncle Bill. So there's a, there's a limit to the health. I mean, sport is great. And we all love sport. And we all, we all love our gladiators to go out there and spill blood on our, for our enjoyment. But, you know, but, but it's not, that's not necessarily healthy, like boxing or rugby, American football, and the bangs that people get to the head. Now, we, we have to discuss these things and we have to be able to put them into perspective to say, you know, there's a, there's a lot that you can get from being involved in sport or watching sport. But don't mistake that for health related physical activities. And even with health related physical activities, there's a price to pay. There are no free meals in life. There are no free dinners. And even something that you do, which, you know, you can demonstrate as being something positive, there's a price to pay for it. And I would much prefer that people were just informed and they can make informed decisions as opposed to just doing something because everybody else is doing it or they were told to do it by this guy. You know, I think you have to be a little bit more informed and particularly when you're dealing with children because you're making choices on behalf of individuals who are too young to make those decisions for themselves. So that's a huge responsibility, I think, you know. So I love listening to your explanation of things. So you've got me curious. How <laughs> would you explain or describe a healthy body? What is a healthy body? Well, what's a healthy body? A healthy body is definitely somebody who's involved in activity, you know, who, who has purpose in life, who, you know, I'm a boarding school boy. And um, some people think, oh, John Sharkey, you know, here he goes again, you know, telling us that we, you know, things like when you get up in the morning, what I do even here, here in Goobin, Tim, this morning I got up and I rolled my, my bed sheets back and I aired my bed. And then I went outside and I went for um, a, a brisk walk and I came back and then I made my bed and I tidied up my room and I've done that every day of my life. Now, I was taught to do that in, in boarding school. I was, you know, and when I would come home to my, to my own family, because I had a brother who wasn't in boarding school and I would see my brother leaving the bed there unmade for my mum to come in and make it. And I just, I just couldn't understand that. You know, I, I just, but perhaps if I hadn't gone to boarding school, maybe I'd have had the same attitude. So get up every day, have purpose in your life, be active, um, you know, help other people when you can, you know, have a po positive attitude in life um, and try to be productive within your community. Community is what it's all about. And don't, don't be worrying about getting rich or any of these other things. If you can offer something to your community, like what you're doing and Sarah and others, I mean, it's just magnificent what you guys are up to and what you're doing. I think you're just, I, I love what you do. And I, I, I love having these conversations with you. And I, I take a peek at your, your podcasts and I listen to the guests yeah. and they seem like a great bunch of people. And I want to encourage that. I think that's just, you know, that's really what, what, what we need in, in, in life. We just need more people who are, and there's so many of them out there, by the way, who really are committed to community. So if you're, if you're active in your community and if you're, uh, by the way, when you're young, this whole coronavirus thing, when you're young, get a chance to get out there and explore and travel. Take that opportunity as well. Everybody deserves to do that. And then maybe come back home with those experiences. Or if you fall in love somewhere and you end up in Ireland or something and you settle down, that's great. But um, you know, get out and travel, get some experience, have a healthy mind, help people and just do what you like to do. 
You know, I, I'm not a dictator. If you're a smoker and you, <laughs> you love every cigarette and you love every, you know, puff, if that's what you love, well, then good luck to you. Now, do you know that smoking damages, do you know that I'm after just taking out two lungs from a, 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 from a, a body downstairs and they were really, really seriously adhered. I mean, my goodness, we had all sorts of trouble getting the lungs out. Um, and this guy had a pacemaker and he had all sorts of other issues. Um, so, so in other words, don't smoke and think that there aren't issues. Be aware of what the issues are. And then if you say, well, do you know what, John? I love my cigarettes. It's a democracy. We live in a democracy. So, you know, go and knock yourself out. But don't do it and think, you know, when the doctor comes along and says, we found some nodules here in your esophagus, sir. You know, it's not just your lungs. Smoking touches every single cell in the human body every single cell of the 100 trillion cells that you have and that's probably a, a, a you know a, a kind of a veering on this on the, on the short side we probably have more than that because a lot of these equations do not look at the body from a three-dimensional viewpoint they're usually two-dimensional figures so based on two two-dimensional mathematics we have 100 trillion cells in the human body and smoking affects every single one of them Good luck with that. So do you know how there's um there seems to be like like truth seems to have uh, layers and parallels to it. Um, so at the beginning when we started talking, you were talking about when we get older, our flexors draw in everything tight. So and so you get you kind of get withdrawn and you you draw up. But you know if you're young and healthy, you kind of you're expansive. So it's almost like, you know, to be healthy, you want to be expansive, but not just physically, right. but in, in everything else, like you want to give or you want to help or you want to, you want to be out there in the community versus being withdrawn or isolated, introverted. That's what I like about you. You see, that's what I like about you. You listen to what I'm saying and all of a sudden you expand it, which is exactly what we're talking about. You've got that capacity to be able to take that on board and say, hang on a second. We're not just talking about muscles and muscle fibers here. This, right. is going, this is going beyond the body. But as I said before, there's a synergistic relationship between us and every living creature on this planet and every you know, non-living structure, you know, non-living structures as well as living structures. We, you know, so for instance, going and just digging something up, you know, uh, coming and just knocking things down just because we want to put a new condo. Uh, you have to be careful about that. Why? Well, that's going to change the flow of water in the area. It's going to drive the water elsewhere. So it's not just about living things. And uh, we have to take care of, we have to take care of this. And so in order to be able to, um, just in the last, we'd say, month to month and a half, I've had a, um, three of my patients who have had um, cancerous tumors removed uh, from their, their body. And um, one of them is, is a breast cancer a patient. Um, so we're now what we're about nine weeks post op, and she is going through full range of motion, and she's just doing great. Yeah. And that's kind of what it's about as well. It's it's about using common sense and getting some professional advice from somebody who's properly qualified, who understands the human body. Uh, if you're going to, you know, get some advice on your on your tax returns, you're not just going to ask some bloke who happens to drink coffee in Starbucks on a Monday and you know that he's good at math, you're going to go to a qualified accountant who understands the law, who understands what your obligations um, and your legal obligations are. And that's what you're, so the same, if you're going to deal with the body, go to somebody who has demonstrated to you that, they, that, that, you know, that they've got the, the knowledge. And what you really want to do is you want to keep the tissues juicy and hydrated. I, I drink plenty of fluid. And I stay hydrated. Yeah. And for the most part, most people need to drink about four cups of water per day if you have a good nutritional, you know, if you've got a good diet. If you're if you're eating well, um, you know, then, then really you're getting 80% of your water to your solid food. And then the rest should come through, you know, three three or four cups of water. And if you're exercising, obviously then you're you're losing fluid. And there are some nice formulae that you can get on the internet for working out how much fluid you've lost and about putting it back in. Don't, don't put it back in all in one go. You know, <laughs> now, you can't, you, generally speaking, you won't drown from the inside out. And uh, unless you've got 
um, if, if you've got places where there's high humidity, you've got to be careful about that as well, because people, particularly if they exercise at a very high level, they can suffer with hyponatremia, which is basically where they lose electrolytes from the system, you know, that they're really losing, you know, high, high levels of fluid, and that can have drastic effects in terms of your heart, etc. So just be aware so of that. Listen, in life as well, you have to have a little bit of, of what's bad for you as well. And that's psychologically and mentally good for you, you know, that you sit down, you know, myself and my wife or some friends, um, and we have a little bite to eat and, you know, have a glass of Chardonnay. You know, don't, you don't have to drink two bottles of Chardonnay. <laughs> you know, have a glass of Chardonnay, enjoy yourself, you know. Well, so there's, there is something to say about, you know, living a long, healthy life and being able to have little pleasures in life. Um, and, you know, it's weird uh, you, if you often see the people that live over 100 years of age, a lot of them, uh, do, but they have habits like they have a, a shot of bourbon every night before they go to bed or something yeah. like that. For sure. I mean, Gunther van Hagen, you know, who I, who I mentioned, um, he celebrated, his father celebrated his 105th birthday just before Christmas. Wow. And there's a photograph of him downstairs, actually, just on the wall. You know, he's 104 on the wall downstairs. And it just said his secret to life is remain active. So um, whether it's, you know, going out and kind of doing a brisk walk, that's, the, that's a big difference between us and the modern era um, compared to maybe smaller communities, you know, maybe in the foothills in Japan or, or Italy where every day you had to walk up a hill you know you, it was necessity so so you did it and you didn't think about it as being exercise it was what you did nowadays what do we do well we're sitting predominantly for you know minimum 12 hours per day and then we want to solve the problem with doing one hour of exercise so you get your one hour of exercise in and, and that's the box ticked and it'd be much better if you if you just had a more active a more active lifestyle uh, spread out over the you know the duration of the day you know as opposed to just simply concentrating on doing one and a half hours or two hours you know, every second day or whatever but look we'll take whatever we'll take whatever we can get because there are so many demands on mums and dads now to bring bring home an income and you know to sustain a household and so on when they get home they're really tired and then they have to make the kids you know school lunches and they have to just never ends for them so you know i simply I, I, thought part of that though is like because we live in such a fast-paced stress-filled world but stress takes a lot of calories too big time yeah and a little you bit know, of stress is great but but stress and stress and stress is just like exercising you know every single day and not giving the body the opportunity to as i mentioned at the beginning to put back what was lost so stress is actually very very good for your hand sale when he when he first uh, wrote the paper which brought the word stress you know to the general public uh, about three years later he wrote a paper to say look i got it wrong i shouldn't have, i shouldn't have used the word stress i should have used the word strain because stress is good for you but if you keep stressing the system and not allowing it to recover not allowing it to benefit from having been stressed then it becomes a strain and that's injurious and that's going to lead to you know pathologies and problems so a little bit of stress is quite good for you. It's like the guy who, you know, wins the lottery and then has a heart attack. You know, maybe he could have done without that stress because he just wasn't ready for it. He just wasn't able to cope with it, you know. So well, that's happened. I mean, years ago, there was a guy in Canada. He won the, the Canadian lottery and within two days he was dead, you know. Wow. wow. What would you prefer, so, to stay alive or win the lottery, you know? It's... Physical. <laughs> Staying alive sounds like a better option. I think so. I think it's a good lottery. I think it's a, it's a particularly good lottery to win. It's, it's just amazing. I was earlier today, I can't help myself when I'm in with a group of people and I talk about anatomy, I bring them out to the outer cosmos and then I, I bring them to the inner cosmos in here. And I played a little small video clip from Carl Sagan. I don't know if you guys know of Carl Sagan, but um, he had a series when I was growing up called the cosmos. He's just an amazing scientist, uh, an American scientist. And um, uh, when Voyager was, was, you know, just kind of leaving, um, uh, it was our last communication with Voyager. The distance between us and Voyager was so vast, it took one last photograph and sent it back to the Earth. And the Earth is just a tiny, tiny little grain of sand, you know, within, within this 
cosmic background. And yet it's just a beautiful piece from Carl Sagan to say that every single person that ever lived, you know, every savior, every, you know, evil individual, every person you've loved, every person you've ever known, you know, it, they've all lived on that little pale blue dot and you've won an amazing lottery to be born, mm. an amazing lottery. And um, if you think about the number of eggs that a woman produces and how many of them do not become fertilized, you know, and then think about you being here, you know, really, I think uh, you have a huge responsibility to one, enjoy yourself, enjoy every moment, enjoy the people around you. Don't hang around with people that put you down or that you don't like. There's just no time for that. Just surround yourself with, you know, with people who you get good vibes from. That's what it's about. It's a great trip. And on that perspective, that was awesome. John, how, how long are you going to be in Gubin? Okay, so here until uh, Friday. We finish up on Friday. And um, then the, the specimens that we have dissected, and there are some amazing specimens, they will then go to being, you know, to go through the process of what we call gas curing, and then they have to be positioned, which is, it's just an amazing talent, amazing, you know, artists have to be involved in positioning and pinning these things, and then they'll be plastinated. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning as well, if anybody's coming to Berlin, or you can look, you can look up Body Worlds um, exhibition in Berlin, and you'll see uh, Freya, who is the, are the first, the world's first, um, Plastinate showing both the superficial and the deep fascia. So, um, yeah, and also, of course, we have the International Fascia Research Congress coming up in Montreal and this year, later this year. So, um, if you're into your fitness and your strength and so on, then check out the uh, Fascia Research Society and um, you know check out that that event. I think you'll really you'll really enjoy it, and they'd love to see you there. And you can network with scientists and others and and really begin to expand our knowledge in terms of whole body connections and fascia science. By the way, I don't like the word fascia. I don't like the word fascia. Fascia is reductionist. You know, so people think that I love the word fascia. No, I, I love anatomy and I love describing anatomy. I love describing wholeness and, you know, connectiveness and continuity. And fascia is a word given to us in the 16th century. So we, you know, we work with it and we have to work with it. It's really a very reductionist term in this at the same time you know so I, I i love it and hate it all in one go you know actually i don't i don't hate anything so i i love it and dislike it all in one go if 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 someone wants to learn more about you and 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 get education from you or to follow you where should they go oh that, that's a difficult one because really i rely on people inviting me to to come somewhere and to do a you know to do a presentation workshops or something like that um but you know john sharkey events.com or else just look up you know john sharkey uh, on facebook john sharkey anatomist or john sharkey dissection or john sharkey fascia i can never remember to him what my what is it john sharkey <laughs> dot two six nine or something or i think that's what anyway you'll, you'll find me on facebook now unfortunately you know, Facebook only allow you to have so many people following you. So that's kind of full, uh, but you are, you know, to join as a friend, but you can follow. And, and I'm dreadful at, at, at uh, social uh, media. I'm really bad at it. Um, but having said that, you know, I do put posts up, you know, and, and letting people know about courses in South Africa or Italy or the USA. I'm in the USA. In, um, well, I'm in Canada for the Fashion Research Society. So I'll be, I'll be presenting there. And then I'll be in um, the Ohio State University in November. So I'll be doing a, a course there, a dissection course, and, you know, talking about all things anatomy, et cetera. So there you go. Yeah, that's as, as or come to Ireland, um, a national training center. So ntc.ie, and you'll learn about some of the things that we're doing there as well. Awesome. John, it was so great to get to catch up with you. I Thanks for taking, out, taking your time out and doing this with us. Oh, I love it. I, I think you're doing a great job and I love supporting that kind of that kind of energy and those efforts. So it's great. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you about consciousness later. So oh, wow, that's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Tim. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.